David and I have been very active in both the author, I mean, me for the author and David for the gaming community for years. So it's not like, you know, we just popped on the scene and just had instant overnight success. That $46,000 comes from years of, of daily hard work and interaction with people and pouring ourselves into the community. If you ask anybody about us, like who's ever interacted with us, they'll probably say, well, like, they'll probably agree. Yeah, like Lydia and David are always offering advice and they want to help. And, you know, we try to make sure like that 90-10 rule that David mentioned, give 90% and 10% of the time be like, hey, by the way, I have something you can buy or hey, guys, check out this link or whatever. And that was a philosophy that I learned very early on you know, that's how you, that's how you build a loyal audience is you care about people and you pour into them and you give them stuff that you genuinely, they genuinely want and you genuinely enjoy making. So it's not overnight, that's years of work. It just all builds up. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 354 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Lydia and David Shearer. Lydia Shearer is an award-winning and USA Today best-selling author of snark-filled adventures, creating stories you love to love and hate to leave, including the Love, Lies, and Hocus Pocus universe of books, which have sold over half a million copies worldwide. David Shearer is a born storyteller and has been an obsessive gamer ever since he was seduced by Magic the Gathering at the tender age of 14. After a soul-crushing job, David has taken on the role of marketing director and lead game designer of Chenoweth Press, a family business that Lydia and David both divide up and run together. We'll talk about the unique talents each of them brings to the table, how they manage the business together and their family, many of the successful entrepreneurial projects they run, and so much more. And that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by the awesome patrons and supporters of this podcast. A special thank you to the patrons who support this podcast via monthly donations at patreon.com slash stark reflections and a reminder that if you're not into monthly donations you can also use the buy me a coffee link at the show notes at starkreflections.ca and speaking of which a huge shout out going to nikki gerlaine for the incredibly generous donation made just recently via buy me a coffee the second one in so many months I mean, this isn't just buying me a coffee. This is buying coffees for me and a bunch of my friends for an entire month, more like. Needless to say, thank you, Nikki, so much for that generosity. And thank you to everyone who supports this podcast. And a reminder that you can support the podcast by leaving reviews of the podcast or sharing the podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. And thank you to everyone who shares this podcast with others and has left reviews. And now for a brief personal update. I'm closing in, finally, on the final, final updates and final, final tweaks to Only Monsters in the Building, the seventh novel in my Canadian Werewolf series, which is launching finally on April 18th, 2024. This has been a long, slow road with, with several projects that slipped in between the cracks while I was writing or working on this book. I had to push the release date off on it twice. That's a record for me. Now, fortunately, uh, I haven't been penalized for that. And more fortunately, that did not lead to any canceled pre-orders for the title, at least not yet. So, Oh, thank goodness for my patience 
and, and loyal readers uh, of that series. It's an interesting one. I've had a lot of fun with it because Michael is at a retreat in upstate New York seeking therapy because, you know, he's not the werewolf that he could be or should be. And he's with a whole bunch of other paranormals who are not who they could be or should be, such as the vegan vampire, um, the ver- the fairy who has trouble uh, deceiving other people, uh, the mermaid who, who just can't attract and actually ends up repulsing people, and uh, so many more characters that I just had a lot of fun with. You know, taking some of the tropes and spinning them on their head with these people who, like Michael, uh, are just having trouble living up to being the proper paranormals. So, you know, obviously the humor that's part of the series is part of it, but there's also a lot of (laughs) Michael's navel-gazing and interactions and discussions with his therapist. And this, probably more than any of the books in the series, Really, I, I drew back upon a lot of resources and help from uh, the Dialogue Doctor, and I'll include some links to episodes uh, with Jeff uh, in in this um, uh, in the show notes here. But this is this has been this has been a really fun yet stressful project to work on, uh, especially because of that encroaching deadline and being sick. And you can still potentially hear it in my voice. I'm feeling so much better, but it's still there in my voice and I'm still cannot shake this cough. But I am. As this wraps up in the next week, I'm looking forward to taking a deep breath and a short break, at least, between finishing this and getting caught up on so many other projects that have had to be pushed to the back burner, including writing a few new short stories specifically for a couple of anthologies that are sort of in my targets uh, with, with looming deadlines. And speaking of short stories, I'm also gearing up for the 20th anniversary edition of my very first published book, One Hand Screaming, which I released, self-published, in October of 2004, people, 20 years ago. Now, from the looks of it, this 20 and the 20th anniversary edition, I've already talked to uh, Juan Pedro and my cover designer about what I want to do with it, with special artwork inside the book as well. Uh, but the 20th anniversary edition will include all the original stories and poems and the author notes I wrote. But the 20th anniversary edition will have twice as many tales in it. Many stories, obviously, that have been published in the 20 years since the book came out, along with a few original and never-before-published tales. Maybe even another Canadian werewolf story. I will be launching a Kickstarter uh, with it, with a special uh, bound limited edition bonuses available. And I've also been in discussions with a brewery from my hometown to get a special beer released for the launch. Uh, Ideally to be, um, you know, at the brewery uh, in Sudbury, but also um, at a local establishment that I'm pretty sure will carry that beer and uh, help me host a launch. I will, of course, talk more about that in uh, future episodes. As I said, my priority right now is to take a short breather, you know, maybe even as long as half a day, three quarters of a day, oh my goodness, (laughs) once I get only monsters in the building out the door. Now, among the projects that I mentioned that slipped in between the cracks while I was working on only monsters in the building was a, a special Canadian werewolf short story I wrote as part of the uncollected anthology. Now, the Uncollected Anthology is a group of writers, awesome writers that I know through various workshops, mostly with uh, Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush, and I will be editing another one of their special workshop anthologies in August. I'm so thrilled. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the show notes, but there are room for five people, uh, five more people to uh, attend that. But in any case, the Uncollected Anthology and, and, and several of the people who are part of the Uncollected Anthology are going to be joining me for a special live StreamYard broadcast to my YouTube channel as well as uh, Facebook, the Stark Publishing Facebook group. And this will be on Wednesday, April 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'll have a link in the show notes. We're just going to be talking about what the Uncollection Anthology is and this new Wear Creatures theme anthology collection that they'd asked me to write a short story for. And so what I did is I created a story in my Canadian werewolf universe called There Ain't No Cure for the Winter Wolf Blues. (laughs) And that story is now available as part of that collection. So you can buy it in the collection, you can buy it as a standalone, and it's available in those formats for a very limited time for this quarter of, of the year, um, the way that they release them. 
Uh, it first rolled out on April 1st, 2024. And I had fun for this story when they invited me, imagining what it might be like for Michael Andrews, um, the aforementioned Canadian werewolf, not just waking up naked in Central Park, it's, which he does um, every full moon, but waking up naked in the snow, it's winter time in, in New York, and being unable to find his clothes that are buried in a snowdrift. Um, and that came out April 1st. And uh, again, short, humorous piece. Just look at And again, most of my Canadian werewolf stories are not about the wolf. They're about the man living with the side effects of being that wolf. And so there is some humor in there. And in a few days earlier, um, in late March, about 20,000 words of a 50,000 word book project that I was, you know, I had on the on the back burner that was going to be coming out later in the year, I ended up releasing a little bit, a sneak peek early, coming out in the fall as a full book, but I released it early as a very exclusive sneak peek edition in the latest The Right Stuff Story Bundle, which was curated by Christine Catherine Rush. So when Chris reached out and said, hey, do you have something for this writer's bundle? I went, oh, uh, I will have something let me get you 20,000 words. Can I do it as a sneak peek? And what I'm doing is in this edition, if you pick it up and I'll explain what the book is, I have a link in the back saying, hey, this is a sneak peek edition. But hey, since you're getting it here as part of this exclusive story bundle, you're only going to see 20,000 words. There's 30,000 more words coming. You can click this link here and let me know your email address and I will send you the ebook of the full book when it comes out. So what is steel, right? Speaking of steel... This story bundle is, you, you can pay what you want. It includes nine books. Three of them are exclusives and a video lecture. Now, my book preview, which is one of the exclusives that I said, is called A Book in Hand, Strategies for Optimizing Print Book Sales via Signings and Other In-Person Events. I explore collaborations with bookstores, libraries, and other venues and draw not only upon my own 20 years of doing author events for my own books, but also tips and strategies that I've learned from countless authors in my writing and book selling roles over the last 30 plus years. Now this bundle is only available for another 14 days and I am recording this on April 4th, 2024. So get it while you can at storybundle.com. Again, that's an exclusive. There's so many other amazing exclusives there, but it's not going to be available for long. And if you don't get that now, if you're looking for that book, a book in hand, you're not going to be able to get it until the fall. But that's it for my long-winded opening intro, introductory matter, the pre-matter for the episode with the interview with Lydia and David. I am not going to address comments because I've already talked way too long and my voice is going... But I am so excited to share this phenomenal interview with Lydia and David. And so after the bumper, that's exactly what you are going to hear. Lydia, David, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to chat with you guys again, although it's more fun in person than it is in a video mm -hmm. chat. But let's let's dig into the background. Uh, we're going to talk about the collaborations you guys do together, the, the press you manage together as a married couple. But um, Lydia, let's dig back into your background as a storyteller and where it all started for you. Uh, <laughs> biological <laughs> imperative. Oh, Okay. <laughs> I just, I was born this way. I can't, I can't blame anything else. Uh, my mom uh, doesn't write fiction, but she writes school curriculums. Okay. And my dad also doesn't write fiction, but he writes uh, computer software and wow. um, lots of uh, family history stuff. So I get it honestly from both sides of the family. Um, and then I just grew up reading everything in sight. And I mean, my mom was reading us the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings by the time I was five. So wow. okay. it was kind of inevitable, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, I grew up science fiction fantasy as my bread and butter. Like I, I adore it and uh, read ton of Bane books growing up all the, you know, uh, Mercedes Lackey and, you know, all the, all the big, all the big science fiction fantasy names you can think of growing up. And just in high school, I started I've always told stories in my head and I started writing down in high school, didn't think anything of it. Uh, but after college and I was kind of searching around for a career path because what I'd studied in college while I loved it, 
it turned out it wasn't a good career fit for me. Right. I, basically, I learned that I hated working for people. Yeah. And I didn't want to have a boss. And my dad is an entrepreneur and started multiple of his own businesses. And so I kind of went that route and uh, tried art first with my sister, who has a degree in fine art. And that was wonderful. But again, it wasn't we found it wasn't something that was like permanently sustainable. Um, and so I had been writing for a couple of years just for fun. And someone said, you should self-publish that. I'm like, I can do that. That's a thing. <laughs> Let's go. And, you know, I was off to the races. So that was about 2012, 2013. Wow. And uh, published my first two books. I mean, David and I got married in 2014 and we made a plan, uh, like a five year and a 10 year plan. And I wrote my first two books and published them in 2016. And it, the rest is history. So that, oh, yeah, and that's we, the Love, Lies and Hocus Pocus series. We failed pretty bad at that 10 year plan. It only took us like five. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, oh my so, God. You just, yeah. You well, just, so I, my goal in down. 10 years, yeah, in 10 years, my goal was in 10 years to be making enough money that David could quit his corporate job and right. come work with us. Well, then the pandemic happened. And he was working from home and I had started doing ads online, which did really well during the pandemic because everybody was stuck at home right. with nothing to do. Um, and so by December 2020, when they were thinking about making him go back to work, I asked him one day, like, like, what did he like gaming and what did he want to get? He's like, I don't know. I don't feel like gaming. And I'm like, what? What? Who yep. kidnapped you and replaced you with an alien? Like, what's wrong? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. Just, I guess work is sucking out. I'm like, great. Two weeks notice. You're quitting. I make as much money as you. You're done. And that was it. He put in his two wow. weeks and he came to work as a marketing director for Chenoweth Press January wow. 2021. And it's been just ever since just rocketing off. So. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And and I want to get into some of the really amazing things you're doing, particularly with direct sales, Kickstarters, all the, all this to, to media tie-in. Um, all right. So promotional merchandise and stuff like that. But David, your background in, in a very similar f fantasy realm, but with role-playing games and, and programming, is that where um, it started? Well, so whenever I was young, I used to uh, play Magic the Gathering because whenever I was in high school, my best friend had these cards and they had these fantasy pictures on it. And I was like, wow, those are really neat. And we sat down like in the back of our classrooms, like after we finished our work, we'd like play Magic so much so that we would like get in trouble because we would, like we wouldn't, we were probably doing the best in class. So they couldn't yell at us for like our grades, but yeah. we would finish all our work early so that we could like turn our desks and like play Magic. Um, and then I, I started going to, uh, I heard about a gaming store in town and I was like, I don't know what, a what do you do at a gaming store? It's not like you play games, but what, like, is it, do they play Monopoly? And somebody invited me out and there was these like, this like shady corner in the back. It was like the, it, it looked like a bar when you walked in, there was like almost no lights. They never cleaned the place. There were used books like in one section because it used to be a used bookstore before the guy bought it. And then there were, there were these kids sitting at folding tables uh, playing Magic the Gathering, playing D&D. &D. And I walked up and just was enamored with it and ended up playing Magic and D&D &D a ton. So much so that whenever I graduated high school, um, I opened my own gaming store. Um, because the gaming store that we used to all go to, uh, the, the guy that ran the store got addicted to EverQuest and would like stop paying attention to the people that was in his store store trying to buy his stuff. And uh, so me and a friend were like, we really want a place to play games and buy stuff, but we can't really buy stuff at the one place in town. And my friend was like, why don't we start our own? And so wow. we, we started our own gaming store. And then fast forward years later, um, I have built home depots for a living. Like I, I was the guy that would go in and turn the big empty box into an actual store. Right. Um, I, I ran a crew that we, we would, pick a they would assign us a section and we'd build out that section and we would do remodels and stuff and uh, it was a really physical physically taxing job and during 2008 whenever um like the economy tanked they didn't want to pay us but they wanted us to still work so we all quit because that's the natural thing that happens whenever a company proposes that to you yeah and i started working at a uh an internet provider just to like phone tech support that's how we got stranded up in kentucky where he met yeah. me <laughs> oh cool yeah. okay <laughs> so yeah traveling around building home depots they they sent me to kentucky to try to, to 
to fix the area uh, because we had a bad reputation in that area. And I was known as a guy that would put out fires. So they sent their firemen up to Kentucky. I was supposed to be here like three months, three to six months. Uh, He's still there. He's still here. We're you still know, in Kentucky. <laughs> years later, I'm still here. That was in 2007. So then you uh, worked at Charter for 11 years, David, something like that? 12, uh, 12, 12 years. Yeah. Uh, and by the time that I I left Charter, I was a high-level phone engineer. Um, so I worked with phone stuff, uh, designing things and programming like pieces of equipment that were worth more money than I would make in a year. And but you uh, would, the more money you'd ever make in your lifetime. <laughs> I, all of them in total, yes. They, they were like... Yeah. <laughs> Ninety thousand dollar pieces of equipment, uh, right? Hundred and eighty thousand dollar pieces of equipment, things like that. And uh, one day, I was uh, during COVID, we went from doing like you know a, a few builds a week to a few builds a day. Oh, wow. uh, our 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 uh, project time, like our time to actually build things, went way down, and the amount of things that we had to build went way up. Uh, and I also had to be on like uh, conference calls with super important people all the time and it was really really stressful uh but then they started we started getting phone calls at like two in the morning where we would design something and the person that was was doing the installation on the over the phone supporting the tech side would screw something up like he'd typo a telephone number or something like that and it wouldn't work and these are like thousands and thousands of dollar projects and so my phone would ring because my name was the person that designed it so they would obviously they're like oh we're gonna blame this guy even though it was a typo on the part of the the agent that was putting it in. And so I would get these calls two, three times a week. And um, I just, I, I hated life. Like everything sucked. Like things were awful. And Which is why I had started publishing in the first place, like years before, is that my goal was that we wouldn't have to deal with that and we could build our own life and work for ourselves. So right. D David, when did you start designing your first game after you started working for yourself? It wasn't right away, was it? No, I wanted to get down marketing. I wanted to like uh, learn my new job. So I I sat down. I I we uh, we took a course called Ammo, um, and I I watched all of the videos on that. I did all the the work for for that that I needed to do to learn how to make ads. And right. I took a bunch of other courses like Mark Dawson. I took a course from him. Uh, watched a course from Brian Cohen. Things like that. Like I I like delved into this I, because I, I have an engineering background like a technical engineering background so I, that's how i i attack things whenever i want to learn about something right so i absorbed all of that information and then i went in and made my own my my first ads and they, they were really well they, i think they were some of the best ads we had done up until that point um but that's because that was my whole job like i didn't have to focus on anything else i was able to like babysit it and and fine tune it and then um <clears throat> after i started getting some more free time I decided I wanted to make games uh, because I wanted to make my hobby into a, a career. And I sat down with a spreadsheet because that's that's probably not how everybody does it, but I, that's how I do pretty much everything. And I started making a list of every possible way you could manipulate a playing card because I thought that playing cards are probably going to be the easiest medium to make something in. Yeah. And uh, like I, like you could flip the card, you could spin the card, you could discard the card, you could hand it to somebody else. Like I just I wrote all these things down, right? Uh, and then I crossed out all the ones that weren't really fun. Like discarding your card isn't really fun because you never actually get to use that card. But if you put the card on the table and then somebody gets rid of it, you've actually used the card, so you it's not as bad. I started going over the psychology of um, of playing card games, and then when I, I was left with like five things that you could do with a playing card like, or how do i make this a game and then i added some more card manipulation uh stuff to it and cat magic was born it took me about 20 minutes or so to like get the rules corrected and get right. the ratios of cards to what i wanted um but then it took like a few days of play testing to uh to get it's it a like, little bit first a little yeah. bit longer than that. <laughs> first play test that we did well to get it functional 
Um, yeah. It took a long time after that. To, that was like the it, first draft. Yeah, to get it printable. Um, well, let's, first... let's go back. Oh, so Cat Magic, right? Yeah. So the game, Cat Magic. Well, Cat uh, Magic, the game, because there's a yeah. book called Cat Magic, too. Yeah. So the let's Love, go back and to the, the series, Love, Lies. Yeah, so Love, Lies, and, and Hocus Pocus is yeah. magical adventure, snarky humor, and a talking cat. Um, okay. It follows Lily Singer, who's a wizard in modern day Atlanta, um, and her crew of magical creatures and friends, and they're setting out to save the world, preferably in time for tea. Right. Um, so it's got some Gil Carriger vibes, it's got some Harry Potter vibes, you know, there's a snarky talking cat sidekick. Um, so it's really great for urban fantasy fans. And uh, we like to say if there's <clears throat> like a scale between Harry Potter and one of the spectrum and Dresden Files at the other end, we're kind of in the happy middle. We've got right. some more, you know, like darker, serious things than most of the Harry Potter books, but it's still very lighthearted and a lot of humor similar to Harry Potter. Um, and so there's eight books in that series so far. Book eight actually comes out March 1st in the main series and then there's some spin-offs there's sir kipling has his own like backstory mini adventures um and there's some short stories and and, and other stuff and so david had designed a game and was like i want to publish a game I'm like okay if you publish a game you should probably skin it in the love lies and hocus pocus world so you have a built-in audience right. because i had already built like a huge audience by that point um, and it would be kind of silly to like not take advantage of that. So we were like, okay, so let's skin it and, and love lies and hocus pocus and see how we can insert it into the world. And so cat magic, the novel was a good like way to go with that because it wasn't in the main series. So it wasn't super plot affecting and it had a cat and it, you know, it's fun and humorous. And so that's, that's like the both business and creative route that we went to kind of launch David uh, with his first game of his of his game design career we wanted to come in with a bang appear with a bang however you'd say that so yeah. this was this was um this was a game david had come up with and then skinning it to cat magic came mm -hmm. after the came gameplay well, well or, yeah i mean somewhere in between or well, while we were draft <laughs> while i was while we were making it or like while i was deciding what all i wanted it to do that's when we had this conversation um okay so in the like after the I made the spreadsheet full of like fun things to do with cards. Then I talked to Lydia um, and we we discussed the marketing of it because if you have to think about marketing whenever you're doing pretty much any project that you want to sell, right? Uh, you have to figure out audience and stuff. And I had always wanted to make a game that would tie in with Lydia's Lydia stuff because I I am part of the ethos like that is Lydia's marketing thing like i mentioned okay. in, in all the posts that we make i mean and also and like a lot of stuff that i write i'm drawing from my family background and my family experience my travels the languages i've learned the books that i've read the people i know like i'm sure it would not surprise you to know there's a character that was heavily uh uh inspired by my husband um or some of my husband's traits so you know so david has always been a part of the creative process of writing this series so yeah. it's, you know, it's not like he doesn't have skin in the game. He wasn't doing any of the writing, but I mean, he's my alpha reader. And, you know, I always ask him for advice on like, what would a guy be thinking in this situation? Yeah. Yep. And I'm always at conventions and replying to people on our, our Facebook groups and stuff. We're pretty joined um, at the hip. So I I always <laughs> wanted to make something that tied in uh, as my first maybe one or two games. One, to get my feet off, feet on the ground with a audience that i've already tried to cultivate and right. like it just helped me to to get that that first bump you know like that get first, momentum going yeah. yeah and um but it was very very early on that we decided that yeah and so you guys uh when you to launch the game you launched it using kickstarter was that the mm -hmm. that was the the first place it was available and yeah. and that was 46 2022 Forty six thousand dollars in twenty twenty two for Cat yeah. Magic, and that was just the beginning, though, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. We sold about three thousand copies in the first year, and to give you perspective on that, most indie game designers, the common knowledge in the indie game design community, as far as I've been able to tell, is whenever they're whenever you're trying to figure out how many games to publish or to print, most people say that you will never spend or never sell more than five hundred copies of your indie published game. So don't right. print more than that. And our first run was 3,000, and it took us a year to get rid of it. Well, the so, Kickstarter sold oh. 600 plus games. So, right yeah. off the bat, like we have to print more than 5,000. So, 3,000 was the best price break for us. And so, you actually did print 3,000, but then yeah. they sold right away. 
Uh, well, no, I mean, obviously year. not right away. Oh, first like year, first, I mean. Yeah, the yeah. first year. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So we so we got 3,000 first print run, and we've done another print run of 3,000, right. um, and we're working our way through that now. So. so that was, I mean, you had a built-in audience, so that's one of the factors. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the other Definitely. factors that helped you with that, uh, with the Kickstarter and, and, and why it was so hugely successful? Cats. <laughs> Cats. So, um. <laughs> I thought you said the... something else. It was a three-letter. No, word. no, no, no. Cats. Okay. Sorry, okay. I was, cats. I was trying to. Be silly. It's a family-friendly game. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. It definitely is. It okay. definitely is. Cats. Um, yeah. So, one of the things that I did is I went to all the social medias, places that I'm already on, like Reddit and stuff like that. Like places, Reddit and Facebook, places where I was in the game design community and talking to people, and I started uh, letting people know that I was creating a game, and when. It, Whenever there's an etiquette to doing things like that, whenever you're in in Facebook groups and stuff, I I try to be an active member of those groups and and give ninety percent and ask ten. That's the ratio that I use. So yeah. I'll be helping people with with uh, they're answering questions and helping people with stuff and telling them my experience on things. And they go, oh, by the way, I'm doing this project. Um, here's the information about it. If you want to go to it, you know, check it out. And every time I would do a post like that, we would get several new um people that backed our kickstarter so some of new backers so just being present in the places that you already are and letting letting the people you already interact with know that you're doing stuff people really want, want to contribute well and also david and i have been very active in both the author i mean me for the author and david for the gaming community for years so yeah. it's not like you know, we just popped on the scene and just had instant overnight success that forty six thousand dollars which I mean, is a huge accomplishment. I'm super proud of it, but also like, isn't that, but I mean, I don't know. Brandon Sanderson is my, is my yardstick. So (laughs) probably (laughs) my expectations are a bit high. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but. um, Multiply, but add a few zeros. Yes, yes, add a few zeros. (laughs) But I mean, that comes from years of, of daily hard work and interaction with people and pouring ourselves into the community. I, I think I wouldn't be, you know, like, sounding prideful or anything to just say that if you ask anybody about us like who's ever interacted with us they'll probably say like they'll probably agree yeah like Lydia and David are always offering advice and they want to help and you know we try to make sure like that 90 10 rule that David mentioned to give 90 percent and 10 percent of the time be like hey by the way I have something you can buy or hey guys check out this link or whatever and that was a philosophy that I learned very early on in like, you know, 2015, 2016, when I was getting started, you know, that was, that was like the advice that I got from people like Mark Dawson and Joanna Penn and like some of the leaders of the indie publishing like boom in the 2013 to 2015 time period when I was researching self-publishing. And there were a couple, you know, just like early bigger names that I took. I didn't pay for anything. Like everybody had free resources and, uh, you know, I just took any free course that I could find and read newsletters and read blog posts and stuff. And it just, you know, became pretty obvious. You know, that's how you, that's how you build a loyal audience is you care about people and you pour into them and you give them stuff that you genuinely, they genuinely want and you genuinely enjoy making. So that Kickstarter is the result of years. I mean, 2022. So six years worth of, you know, out of us putting ourselves out. And then we had an opportunity to be like, hey, we created a game. It's like our first game. It's Cats. It's related to my book series that people already know and love. And I did not promote that kicks. I was pregnant and terribly nauseous when we launched that Kickstarter, pregnant with my second. And so I, I, launched my first four books with Kickstarters, two books and then two books and two different Kickstarters back in 2016 and 2017. And I worked my butt off to like promote those because at that time I had no audience or at least a very small audience. I didn't know a lot of people. And so they were massive amounts of work. This Kickstarter, man, like we put it up and we're like, here you go guys. Like I did not schedule any interviews. I did not schedule any like Kickstarter trade posting, like all the stuff they say you should do. I didn't do any of that. Pregnant yeah. man, I feel awful. Like we just put it up there, and so that forty six thousand, you know, six hundred and twenty backers. That was just our audience, and then all of David's, you know, his gaming community that he'd been cultivating for years. So, yeah. wow, it's that's not a- overnight. That's years of work. Yeah, of it course, it just all builds yeah. up. Yeah, all the things that you don't see behind the scenes. Now, mm-hmm. the other thing that you guys do, which which is just incredible, is you talked about ads. 
but you're driving ads for direct sales. You do a, mm -hmm. a massive business uh, with direct sales. You're also 80%. available through retailers, but 80% of your sales. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, one at one hand, you're like, oh, wow, I guess I'm not ranking anywhere, but you're, you're rolling in the dough. I always say in the, in the wide mentality, exactly rolling, bank right. well, but bank over rank, right? Yeah. Yeah. Meaning that, yeah. Okay. Whatever. I'm not on a list, but, I but care. I know who my customers are. <laughs> I'm selling and I can to pay my mortgage. Yeah. I can pay my mortgage. I don't care what my Amazon rank is. I can pay my mortgage. That's way more important. <laughs> and and you guys actually have like you you, you order like three thousand copies of the game. You have skids of products. We have fifteen thousand copies of my books in in our basement. Wow, that is just incredible. How do you? So the the two of you obviously run this business together. You divide up and split the responsibilities. You are <laughs> joined at the hip. Um, do you do it all yourselves or do you have help with some of it? No, we've got a couple um, part-time helpers. Um, so I have a VA virtual assistant that helps with, you know, customer service and replying to emails and social media and stuff. Okay. Um, I still write all of my posts myself and still like respond to most comments myself, but she'll like, she's there to check and make sure, Hey, make sure the messages don't pile up and Hey, make sure if I, you know, I, I, I respond to all the comments on my posts. She keeps an eye on the comments on the ads because they're wow. more like impersonal comments. Um, and so she helps with that. And then we have someone who helps with the book packaging because that's a menial task that doesn't require the skill of either me and David. So it's a terrible use of our time for us to package books. Right. So we, we hire a college student um, who's become a, a good friend of ours to come twice a week and package books for us. And, you know, once she graduates and moves on, like, we'll look for another, another similar person in that situation where they just need a part-time job, um, you know, a couple days a week to come. Um, and we figured that out pretty early on. Like, once we started running ads and our book volume went from one or two orders a week to, like, 20 or 30 orders a week, David right. was doing all the packaging and he he was didn't have time to do his other stuff, like yeah, running yeah. ads. Like, okay. We need to hire somebody to do this. So, yep. so it started with like you know a close family friend or you know like my yeah. my sister helped out or whatever, and then we're like, okay, we gotta hire, like actually hire a person. We we need a, a and not and they're not an employee. You know, I, that's why I'm like a part time helper. Right. Um, so yeah, we those are our two main people who help in our business, contractors, I guess you'd call them, yeah. um, that we work with on a regular basis. Um, and then everything else, like all the marketing, the operations, financials you know, social media, newsletters, and then all the publishing aspects, you know, the publishing process of editing. Like, obviously I have contractors I work with. I have an editor, I have a cover designer, I have a formatter, like all that. Um, but we do those, we do the the hands-on okay. stuff ourselves. Now, do you, how, for, for the website, uh, are you using Shopify or some other yeah. software? No, Shopify. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's, I mean, just, just looking at all the options and we, you know, we we benefited a lot from the AMO course, which stands for Author Marketing Mastery and Optimization, or something like that, okay. um, done by Steve Piper. Uh, and through, we benefited. It's through optimization. Through optimization, okay. Author Marketing Mastery through optimization, yeah. um, and we benefited from Steve Piper's like decades of ex like marketing experience and te so he was testing all the sites and testing all the platforms and seeing which one you know had the best uh, read through which one had the best like conversion rates and all that which one had the best prices right. and so when we started you know we he was like okay guys here's this 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 and this that I recommend you could try that it's okay, but you know, this one's probably the best. So we just started out on Shopify. We didn't do any of the testing of other sites ourselves. We, you know, benefited a lot, which is why you, you pay for a course because you're paying for somebody's experience. Right. Yeah. So yeah, Shopify. And then we use book funnel to fulfill the eBooks. And then we use David, tell them a little bit about the, the shipping fulfillment. What do we, what uh, programs do we use for that? So for shipping, we use a plugin for Shopify called pirate ship. Uh, it lets me import in all of my orders, uh, and then I print with just a about a Dymo printer to print out the labels that we purchase from Shopify. And in Shopify, we can print out the the packing slips for all the the orders. So okay. I just take the packing slips and the labels that I print out after I do a bulk printing and like pair them together. And our uh, uh, lady that comes in and packages books for us does the rest. Wow! I don't even. I have become really good friends with our UPS people <laughs> because they are uh, the postal service people are like the lifeblood of our, our shipping. 
So I want to make sure that they are happy. Uh, yeah. We we could schedule for home pickup. So after after uh, Grace comes in and packages our orders, we uh, throw them all in tubs that the postal service gives us, and then she the lady that picks up our mail comes up and knocks on our door, and I open the garage and right. hand her the tub. She hands me new tubs, and that's how it works. Wow. Wow. So I have to think that you guys, I mean, because you, you work together, you both work from the home, you're working on the same business together. Um, you obviously, you have kids, so that's part of the the yeah. distraction from work. We have, but I we mean, have a nanny. We have a nanny who takes oh, okay. care of them during the work day because there's no okay. other way we could oh, yeah, work. They're, like, not we in, they're not school age yet. So they're, they're not around. Yet. Yeah, not yeah. yet. So okay. they're around all day. Yeah. There's no way that either of us could work full time to run a business if we didn't have someone. And, right. and I mean, it's either that or put them in daycare. And we, it's very important to us that our family be close by and that we, like I get to hang out with my kids like multiple times a day and eat lunch with them and stuff. Right, and so, right. you know, ha- choosing to go the nanny route. And of course it means we don't have to drive, you know, however long every morning yeah, and every right. afternoon to pick up. So the nanny thing was very difficult because it took a long time we had to actually hire a nanny finding service to vet people and to find people because we just couldn't find anyone qualified. Um, and so there was definitely like an expense in that, but it's way, way, way worth it for the for the kind of close knit family unit and like at home have everything here with us that we wanted for our yeah. life. Yeah. Um, and it might be different for everybody else like that. That's just what what, what works for us. Um, and so there, it's a little bit difficult sometimes because, you know, my five-year-old will be knocking on the door like, mommy, mommy, look at this picture I drew. I'm like, buddy, I'm working. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like they, like we set boundaries and the kids are pretty good about it. And, you know, we love them even when they interrupt. And then our oldest is getting ready to start kindergarten next year. And so, you know, it'll be like a shit, like a change, you know, figuring out that new schedule and rhythm. But, you know, this is what we always wanted for our family and, you know, we, we, it's expensive, but we were like, Hey, we make our own money. So work harder, publish more books, <laughs> and we can live the life that we always wanted to live. Right. Our five-year-old actually wants to be a part of our business. He has discovered yeah. capitalism and <laughs> entrepreneurial. <Yeah. laughs> we were walking through like a Walgreens and we walked past the candy aisle to wherever we were going to pick up. And he's like, daddy, I want to buy some candy. Like, well, you don't have any money. How are you going to buy candy? You got to to get money to buy candy. And he's like, how do you get money? I'm so you have to get a paying job. He's like, Daddy, you own a publishing company. Can I have a paying job? <laughs> and I was like, that I can't argue with this. <laughs> this is I have to cultivate this. Uh so I, I brought him home and this was back whenever I still packaged the books myself. And I was like, all right, I'll give you he was like books. barely four, three and a half yeah. four. Yeah. I was like, I'll uh because he knew all of our books by color, number, and name. Like he could look at the books and be like, that's book one, that's beginnings. And mostly and just so. color because he can't yeah. read yet. <laughs> but he, he, he could recognize the numbers. At that point, he knew the numbers. Now he can read the, the titles. But I said, I had like 20 orders. I set them all out and I was like, all right, buddy, let's let's get these books and put them on the these sheets because the, the printing, the packing slip has the pictures of the books on them. And he, he filled all those orders. Like I, I went off to to do something else. And I came back totally expecting to have to redo everything that he did, but he didn't miss a single one. He got all the, <laughs> the orders right. So I gave him like a quarter and he ran off all happy. And the next day after I had made breakfast, he was standing at my door waiting for me to go to work because he wanted another paying job. So I, <laughs> I found something for him to do. I had a notebook from my previous job that had like those clear pages that you put like printed pages in. And I wanted to reuse that that uh, binder. So I'm like, there's 600 pages in this. I will give you a penny per page you pull out. Um, and he made $6 that day. And he, <laughs> like, from watching us, um, he at one point uh, stopped and went over to play with his toys. Like, Daddy, I'm taking a break. And he, he sat there for, like, 10 minutes or so and, like, played with his little cars and stuff. And he's like, Daddy, my break is over. And then he, like, went back over <laughs> to the table and started pulling more stuff out. And um, like halfway through the day, I'm like, all right, buddy, it's time for lunch. You want to go have lunch with me? He's like, daddy, I'm busy. I'm working. <laughs> like, but you got to have lunch. So we went up and we had lunch, came back down. And like, he's he's been doing stuff like that ever since. Oh, my God. Uh, 
Well, now he he's quite the artist. He's very artistic. And now he's drawing pictures to sell. He sells his artwork. So he'll draw a batch of pictures and then I will take him around the neighborhood and he will sell the pictures. We li- There's a lot of older people in our neighborhood. And so he'll yeah. sell pictures to the elderly people in the neighborhood. He thinks it's adorable that a five-year-old is coming to sell that. So he sells them for five bucks. He made bank. <laughs> And uh, at Christmas time and spent the money on buying presents for his oh friends goodness. and stuff. So here I can show you one. D- David's about to show off one. And I stole this one for myself. I said, but I'll give you a dollar for this. Because it's got a bubble bee in it. And it's got oh, a butterfly. Cool. And, a right. butterfly and it was just the cutest thing ever. <clears throat> so, yeah. So our, our kid is very <laughs> entrepreneurial already. He's like, well, mommy, what's your money? Yeah, the apple does not <laughs> fall far from the tree. Does it <laughs> seem to be multi generational? All right. So uh, as we get close to wrapping up uh, the podcast, I just want um, for anyone who's thinking of working uh, as a couple who may be interested in in turning this creative and these creative endeavors because you 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 both bring different creative elements to this very business. brain different. Very yeah, brain different. Brain different, but still very creative, very uh, very entrepreneurial. Uh, what's some advice that you would each offer to people who are thinking that this may be for them? David, you go first. Uh, be patient because it is not going to work out immediately. Uh, there's going to be a lot of like headbutting and a lot of like, unless you work the exact same way. And chances are that if you are a married couple, you don't work the exact same way. You're going to have things where, where like you do something different from from your spouse or from the person you're going to be working with. And it, things, they're going to have different standards and different things that you put value on. Uh, so finding those differences and working those differences out and leaning on each other's strengths. Like I'm I'm very much a let's throw it in a spreadsheet and do the math. And Lydia is much more driven than I am. So she is much more, let's get this thing done right now. And I'm like, well, let's let's look at all the facts. Let's calculate this thing. Let's, let's do a bunch of research. Right. So generally whenever something comes up and it's a let's do a whole bunch of research and throw it in a spreadsheet it goes to me and then if there's a thing where it's like well this is a business thing and it's technical and you have to save documents that's going to go to Lydia right Uh, (laughs) because we just found that that's how we work best uh if it's something involving like a physical product or shipping or anything like that like that's I love that that's my wheelhouse and Lydia is all about the the intangibles and the the emotional things and social things yeah I would say that it's really important, you know, as David said, to realize it's going to take some time because we knew how to live together and how to function as a family, but we'd never worked together and we'd never owned a business together. And that's, I thought it would be pretty much the same, but it's not, it's very, very different. Um, And so a big thing that we learned at the beginning is that it was very important to stop and communicate about what was going on because we'd often be frustrated with each other. Um, we like I would give him, okay, I'm doing this, David, I need you to do these tasks. And then there would be some sort of miscommunication, or he would take X when I had meant Y. And then I just had expectations and he had expectations. And you know, you got to stop and communicate. And I think a, also a really big thing is just remember to love each other. You know, it is business, but also you're doing this with your best friend because you want to and you and you love them and this is your life together and so it's important to stop sometimes and step at least for me especially because I would often get frustrated to step back and be like okay it's going to be fine our business is going to be fine let's just figure out like what's going to work for both of us in a healthy way and then get back to work because you know, we can't we can't build off of a shaky foundation. We can't build off of a foundation that has all these little holes of miscommunication or annoyance or, you know, you can't be silent about stuff. You cannot not communicate or it will not work. <laughs> you have to stop right. and be like, all right, I'm annoyed right now. I don't really know why, but let's talk this out and figure out like where we cross wires and then figure out a compromise. You have to compromise. And I mean, if you're already a married couple, like probably you already know some of that stuff and, and, and you, and you've cultivated those skills. So you just have to pivot a little bit and be more impersonal because it can be, it can feel very emotional, especially the creative aspect. You can be like, Oh, this is like my project. I don't want to make these compromises, but then you have to realize that if you don't want to make compromises, then you got to work by yourself. Like, sorry, that's just the way life is. And so that was something hard for me to learn because I'm personally micromanaging 
Um, and so I had to learn how to be less micromanaging and David had to learn to accept a little bit more of my tweaking and finagling. Um, and so, yeah, we, you just got to communicate really well and find a happy middle. So. Oh, wow. Awesome. Well, for anyone who is interested in checking out your books and checking out your uh, channel with press, et cetera, where can people find you guys online? Channelwithpress.com, LydiaShare.com. They all go to the same place. If you literally just Google my name or if you Google Love Lies and Hocus Pocus, we are the top like three pages of Google search results uh, on all the platforms. Our books are available on any retail platform, anywhere you can buy books. And then if you want to get some discounts or if you want to support us directly, um, you can always go direct to store.lydiashare.com and get, you know, the books, ebooks, audiobooks, you know, whatever you want straight from us. So awesome. Awesome. And uh, there'll be links to all those in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Lydia, David, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Thanks so much for having us. No problem. Have a good day. So there's two things that I want to reflect on. And the first is when David and uh, Lydia talked about, you know, defining and building the life that they want to live. The example of the nanny, right? So they've got two kids, uh, they both work from home, and they wanted the nanny so that they could have the kids close to home. You know, Dave talked about having lunch with his five-year-old who was, you know, <laughs> taking a lunch break from work and stuff like that. And so the life they wanted working together, running this company together, you know, hiring the nanny was a lot more expensive than, you know, uh, a daycare. Uh, but then that would mean taking the kids to daycare, etc. And so the whole idea of... This is going to cost us more money. So what do we need to do in our business uh, in, in order to, to be able to afford that? Because it was important to them. It's not all that different than the priorities that we make on, on a day-to-day basis. Is what is the priority? What is the life you want? And how are you going to make that happen? It's often, when I do one-on-one consultations with authors, I know there's no guarantee of anything that you do as a writer that's going to make money. As a matter of fact, I can, you know, one of the guarantees is there's no guarantee. <laughs> is that there's no, you can't tell. You, you don't know how, how a book is going to do, even when you invest all of the right money in making the book and in marketing the book. So that's why when I'm talking to authors about it, you know, do I write to market? What do I do? And it's like, well, I've got these, this and this and this that I want to work on. I often say, work on the projects that have the most intrinsic value to you that you would get, you personally would get the most out of just working on it, just completing that project. Everything else is gravy. So if you finish the book that you've always wanted to write, the book that resonates truly in your heart, you win. You've already won just finishing the book. Anything else that happens is a bonus. If it happens to sell well, you've won. If it happens to become some sort of bestseller, you win again. You know, it's multiple winnings. If it reaches a small group of readers, but you know that it makes an impact and has improved someone's life. You know, maybe you hear from one reader who said, thank you for writing this book. It changed my life. You won. So you start off winning and then you continue winning if it's a huge success. And if it's not a huge success, you still won because you invested time in something that meant something personally to you. And that's the one thing where I think there's there's never a guarantee, but that's closer to a guarantee of at least how you feel when you finish the project. So that's sort of in relation to that life you want to live, right? You know, um, because you never know what, what could happen. The second thing is related to, you know, the Kickstarter and the social media and and the giving 90% of the time and asking 10% of the time. That community building, that engagement in a community with authenticity not because you're trying to get something, but because it's just part of the whole business. That's not something, it is something you can fake. But often people will see through that. If it's genuine, if it is something that's, you know, something 
where you're actually truly a part of it and truly connected. People will feel that. As, as my friend James Owen, and I quote him all the time from his drawing at the Dragon's Talk, as James said, if you want something bad enough and, and you work hard for something bad enough, people will see it in you. They will believe in you and they will find ways to help you. And, and I truly do believe that. I feel from listeners, uh, from, from the, the folks who uh, leave, leave comments or have reached out to me by email, have commented even, uh, even if you haven't done that, but I've, I've seen you or I've bumped into you or I've, I've, I've gotten a comment from you somewhere online or in person where you've talked about, you know, uh, you know, listening to the podcast, like when, when Gail Carriger and she's going to be a guest on a, on a future episode and I interviewed her just last week, you know, when she said, I listen to your podcast, I love it. And, 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 and I was blown away because I'm like, you, okay, like, do you know who you are and who I'm not? So those things, those things to me are authentic connections that we have. And to that end, I feel a part of your community. You're not a part of my community. I'm a part of your community. And, and it feels like we're in this together. And, and that being said, when somebody reaches out from that community, I feel that I want to see you succeed. And I feel invested in your success, in our success collaboratively together. And that's where that power comes from. When Lydia and, and David talk about the Kickstarter, the power comes, especially in those Kickstarters, from people who see something that you're doing with such passion. And they want to, and they want to be a part of it. They want to be a part of making that happen. It's why I feel so amazingly, uh, in, incredibly um, charged and, and energized by supporting Kickstarters. When I see people that are excited to share something that they've done, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that action. So anyways, that's that, that giving 80, 90% of the time asking 10 or 20% of the time, which I, th- I really think is a, is a phenomenal long-term plan. And again, it, like Lydia says, and this is in the clip, the opening, it's not something that just happens. It's something that you build and curate as part of this greater community for long-term. And I'm always thinking about the long term because this is something I've always wanted to do in my life and I'm living the dream. I am living the life that I want to live. I'm so fortunate and so blessed. I'm blessed to have the life I have. I'm blessed to have you, dear listener. Yeah, you, I'm talking to you, listening to this right now. That is such an honor. And so... With the gratitude I have for you and the honor that I have that I get to live this phenomenal life and you guys are a part of it, thank you for that. I'm closing out this episode and this reflection. And so until next week and until next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you, dear listener, great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Every time I call my editor and beg because I'm late My muse says, no die, son, you must procrastinate Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do But there ain't no cure for these writing block blues